LGBTQ advocates are condemning Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' decision to sign into law a bill that bans transgender women and girls from competing on female school sports teams. Similar laws have gone into effect around the country. Robbie Gaffney from WFSU at Florida State University reports the signing comes on the first day of Pride Month. This is not a coincidence. To entirely disregard and devalue our community on the first day that we should be celebrating our identity as a community is something that we will not forget. That's Alfonso David with the Human Rights Campaign. His organization plans to challenge the law that would force transgender women and girls to play on male sports teams. The naysayers are going to lose this battle. They have fought us for decades and they have lost and they will continue to lose. Lakeland Republican Senator Kelly Stargell helped push the bill forward last session. She says the new law isn't meant to be discriminatory. This bill is very simply about making sure that women can safely compete, have opportunities, and and physically be able to excel in a sport that they've trained for, prepared for, and worked for. Supporters of the new law say it's needed because transgender women could have a competitive advantage in sports. They often point to a pair of transgender women in Connecticut who beat their cisgender counterparts in high school track team competitions. Both those women are black, and David says the reasoning for the ban is not only rooted in transphobia, but also racism. The images that proponents of these bills most often use are black trans women and girls. Black girls and women have had their bodies constantly policed in athletics and beyond, and these bills are another hateful take. A federal judge dismissed a lawsuit that would have stopped the two transgender women in Connecticut from competing in female sports. Since 2013, 11 transgender students have applied for and been approved to play on the team that aligns with their gender identity in Florida. Winter Park Democratic Representative Carlos Guillermo-Smith says those students have been able to compete without incident. They couldn't find, uh, and as they were repeatedly asked to do, proponents of the bill could not find a single incident uh, or issue uh, that came up as a result of that 2013 policy. Megan Tickcomb is the mother of a transgender girl. She says conversations at the dinner table have been hard since the bill has been taken up by lawmakers. It's just not fair. It's just, it's hard as a parent to tell your kid, I'm sorry, honey, you can't play, but I can't explain why. And there's nothing I can do about it other than move out of the state. And I know a lot of parents in a lot of other states fighting similar issues, and we can't all just keep moving around hoping to find a better life for our kids. Like, that's not the answer. Titcomb says protections are going to have to come down from a national level to protect transgender kids. Seven other states have passed similar laws to Florida's transgender sports ban. For WFSU News, I'm Robbie Gaffney. Whether they are allowed to play sports or not, there are trans children attending schools across the country. These students, as well as all transgender people, have specific health care needs as well as, well, just plain old general health care. Those are the issues Steph Schuster examines in their book, Trans Medicine, The Emergence and Practice of Treating Gender. Dr. Steph Schuster is an assistant professor of sociology at Michigan State University. When we spoke last week, I asked how they got involved in the topic. Yeah, so the work began when I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa, and it actually emerged from doing a lot of healthcare advocacy work. When I moved to Iowa City back in 2007, there really were not a lot of providers working with trans people, and it was through that work that I started learning from providers their own concerns, their uncertainties, Uh, where they felt like their knowledge gaps were in working with trans people. And that then kind of led to me uh, going out and collecting data and finding out what other providers thought and felt about their work with trans people. How prepared are schools for dealing with trans children, either medically, psychologically, or just socially? As a sociologist, I feel compelled to say it is dependent on the school system itself. I think when we look at national conversations about schools and how they're responding to trans youth, some seem to be doing really well in instituting, for example, anti-bully policies, allowing trans youth to use whatever bathroom, locker room, et cetera, that matches their uh, gender identity, um, and building into the curriculum more acknowledgement that there's 
girls and boys and trans girls and trans boys and non-binary people. And there are other schools that seem to be throwing up their hands and saying, we have no idea what to do, um, which actually reminds me a lot of how medical providers seem to respond as well. <laughs> I think that when we consider education is built on a lot of assumptions, I'm thinking about classic curriculum in sex education, for example, girls go in one room, boys go in the other. Where would you put a trans youth in those conversations? And I think that if you ask trans youth, they would say they should go to the room that matches their gender expression. But school administrators aren't always ready to respond quickly and, and nimbly to the fact that there are trans people in their classrooms. I imagine once you get to the university level, it, it gets a little easier. Somewhat. Uh, in some ways, in some ways, there's still a lot of unresolved, you know, housing is a big question mark for some universities. They're just not, you know, a lot of dorms, for example, are based on sex segregation. And while some might have co-ed floors, it still puts trans people in a bit of a burden in having to figure out if they want to be out as trans people and just how to negotiate that. And I think also we have to remember that in student health services, a lot of providers, although I think it might be shifting right now, but a lot of providers previously didn't really have a lot of experience either in how to work with trans people. I think the challenges are different, but there still are challenges even for college age uh, trans people. Does it seem like, given the current political environment, that trans people have become the latest convenient boogeyman? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, so some of my side work is also in social movements, and I think a lot about the push and the pull of gains made and gains lost. And yes, there are, I mean, hundreds of bills right now being introduced in state after state that are really attacking trans people. I think we also have to remember that a lot of these bills are specifically targeting trans youth. I don't think that it's spontaneous that trans women and trans girls specifically are being targeted for a lot of bills. And there are a lot of misconceptions about, well, there's a lot of misconceptions about trans people in general. Um, and I think that the work that I do in my book explores how the history of trans medicine has shaped not only contemporary practices in trans medicine, but it also reflects our broader cultural understandings of trans people in general. Um, there are a lot of myths that have circulated about trans people in general and also trans women and girls since at least the 1950s. So is this a problem that exists or doesn't exist? I actually don't know how to answer that particular question, but I think what I can say is that some of the scientific misinformation that I see playing out in a lot of these conversations right now are not actually new conversations. Ideas about what testosterone does or does not do for people and their bodies, their capacities, et cetera, is built on a very shaky foundation of evidence. So when I hear legislators talking about uh, unfair advantages um, that trans women will have in athletics, for example, those statements are sometimes perceived as truth because, you know, they refer to science, um, but the science itself is also shaky. The way that I want to reframe the conversation sometimes is to think carefully about what it does to a group of people to block them from being able to participate fully in social life. Fair enough. How and when did science and medicine get involved? I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is not something that this has popped up one day in the 60s. Yeah, it's a, it's a part of a long history of the scientific and medical community being really interested in difference, bodily difference, identity difference. In my work, I place the emergence in the 1950s, um, but it predates that point too. So we can even go back to the early 1900s as the field of, for example, sexology was taking off. But yet, like we have to remember that the way that they understood gender and sex and sexuality were different than how we understand it now. But sexologists in the early 1900s 
were really interested in questions about people who engaged in same gender sexual practices and how to understand that and what that meant for people who did that. And then it was really in the 1960s that we start developing new language that breaks up these categories and, and psychologists in particular start thinking about how sex and gender and sexuality are distinct. So in some ways, that's why I place the emergence or really kind of like the takeoff of trans medicine in the 1950s. Uh, but it certainly is happening before then as well. Were medical doctors and psychologists getting together on this or were they fighting each other as this field was emerging? Uh, it's a really complicated history. In the 1950s, physicians were beginning to work with trans people, and trans people were finding physicians mostly through word of mouth. Physicians were also starting to reach out to each other, right, through letters of correspondence. And there was one particularly well-known uh, endocrinologist mm -hmm. named Harry Benjamin who really had just a massive amount of knowledge because he was so well known that most trans people would write to him and ask for help. So that's what's happening in the 1950s is physicians are turning to Harry Benjamin to seek help. And so he would share his knowledge of his clinical experience working with trans people. And right around the end of the 1950s, they started worrying about and it really was the beginning of their concerns that the people who showed up in their clinics asking for gender affirming care might not really truly be trans. Uh, and I say all this with scare quotes. <laughs> so they, they felt compelled to call on therapists to help them decipher, is the person before me really a trans person or are they delusional? Um, because in the 1960s, at least, parts of the therapeutic community thought that trans people were like that there was no such thing as being trans that it actually was just a symptom of delusional thinking and possibly schizophrenia and so while physicians initially invited therapists into the conversation into the work that also set off conflict between them because physicians did not want to give up their authority um, but they had to in some ways because they were relying upon therapists to help them make assessments. And so since that time, it really has been, it's, it has been a conflict between physicians and therapists over who has the authority to decide when someone is trans and also if they should be allowed to have gender affirming interventions. Well, finally, what's the goal? Looking ahead, where would you like to see attitudes, knowledge evolve? I think that medical providers, especially medical residents, could benefit from more than just a singular diversity day where they're exposed to information related to lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer patients. I also think that what that could look like is not only increasing more exposure for medical residents, but also infusing the curriculum with trans people, you know, medical residents learn a lot from case studies. And so what would it be like to have a case study of a, a cancer patient who also happens to be trans? I think familiarizing medical residents with the existence of trans people who need medical care outside of just gender affirming specific care would help with that process. Again, the name of Dr. Steph Schuster's new book is Trans Medicine, The Emergence and Practice of Treating Gender. Still to come, the pandemic seems to have caused a jump in students applying for medical school. We'll chat about that next on The Best of Our Knowledge. Got any questions or comments about the best of our knowledge? Send them in. Our email address is knowledge at wamc.org. And if you'd like to listen to this or any past programs again, you can find them online at our flagship station's website. Just go to wamc.org and click on the programs link. And while you're there, subscribe to the Best of Our Knowledge's podcast or download the WAMC radio app to listen on demand anytime, anyplace.
This is the best of our knowledge. I'm Bob Barrett. Applications for 2021 admissions to U.S. medical schools increased 17 percent over last year, a larger increase than in previous years. Applications to nursing programs have also increased. Many people attribute that rise to a post-pandemic desire to help. That's the topic of an article in Stat News called Pandemic-Inspired Idealism is Prompting Careers in Healthcare." caveat emptor. It's written by our friend Dr. Timothy Hoff, a professor of management, health care systems and health policy at Northeastern University. I asked him why he took on the article. I've just finished a book that's going to be coming out at the end of the year, looking at uh, in part why young people choose to become doctors now. So my interest sort of has been longstanding. I also study issues like burnout, career regret, you know, lots of fun things. Uh, that we study among professionals, highly trained professionals. So I've always been interested in sort of the crisis that's in a lot of healthcare occupations like medicine and nursing around things like burnout and job dissatisfaction. But certainly now the pandemic has sort of brought all those negative things more to the fore, but then also has now emphasized, you know, obviously the positives of why people might choose to go into a healthcare occupation to begin with, you know, all the all the sort of heroic things that our healthcare professionals did during the pandemic. Yeah, the article kind of brings together the two sides of the story is one side is like, oh, my God, I can't take this anymore. The other is, oh, my God, I can't wait to get into this. Yeah, it's medicine and nursing and uh, these kinds of helping professions. They've always had a self-selection of people going into them that sort of have an interest in social justice and, and altruism and wanting to help others. And certainly the last year, I think, has sort of heightened that feeling even more in lots of young people. And that's a really great thing. Um, you know, we've seen how our healthcare system in a positive ways has really stepped up and helped us during this time. And so you have a lot of young people that naturally are draw- drawn to, you know, professions like medicine and nursing because of the wanting to help others. But that obviously run runs up to into, you know, what what the jobs are really like, you know, once they're out there doing them often years later after they train. I think we've spoken before about how a crisis will bring about people wanting to get in and start helping. Uh, We brought up that uh, after 9-11, a lot of people enlisted in the military. Is this kind of the same thing? You know, it's a yeah. I mean, I think we'll need to see how it plays out. You know, you know, medical school admissions, nursing admissions, uh, for example, both went up significantly last year. Uh, we'll see if it's a one-off, if it just happens for a year, if it's more of a trend. If it's more of a trend, then then yeah, I think we could assume it. You know, the pandemic has been one of these events that alters uh, how people think about what they want to do in their careers, and and maybe we'll see, you know, young people for the next decade kind of flow into professions like medicine. The other reason people might be choosing it more now, these professions, is because they're also still fairly secure occupations. Uh, you know, they're good jobs. And to the extent anyone's thinking about what's a good career to go into that might be recession proof and might be sustainable, certainly healthcare occupations like this fit that bill. Is this bump across all healthcare occupations? We don't know yet because we haven't seen some of the admissions data for across occupations, like for example, social work, nurse practitioners, Certainly medicine experienced, I think it was approximately a 17% increase in applications for this coming fall. Um, Nursing was up 5% last fall. So I think we can assume it's it's probably going to be across the board. I mean, the healthcare occupations generally are becoming more popular because of uh, the amount of jobs that are going to be available uh, in the future. And so people see that. But I also think that we'll probably see this uh, at least temporarily across the board, my bet is, in, in multiple healthcare occupations, this rise in sort of applications. You bring up that a physician's job, and especially during this pandemic, is is morphing and changing with, with telemedicine and so many other things. What will medical schools have to do to adapt to all that? Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. You know, all of our jobs changed during the pandemic, right? And those of us who do service jobs, you know, professors, lawyers, engineers, doctors, um, we all had to do, for example, increasing portions of our jobs virtually. We needed to figure out how to use technology better in our, in our work. We needed to learn all sorts of new 
skills and, and enhanced skills like empathy and uh, resilience. So I think medical schools, for example, they're going to need to at least for a while, look at how to retrofit some of what they do to train young doctors and, and also in nursing young nurses to actually get more of these qualities before they come out into the real world. You know, qualities like empathy, resilience, flexibility, pragmatism, as well as understanding how to take care of people in the virtual space uh, and how to uh, do one's job in a variety of different ways. Doctors, I don't think, can any longer be taught that you're going to see a patient 100% of the time in front of you in an office, in an exam room, and that's how you should learn to do your job. Uh, That's not probably going to be the way it's going to be moving forward for most doctors. Are there enough spaces in medical schools to take on this bump, and are there enough teachers for them? You know, right now, I think medical schools are, you know, I think they're delighted to have such an increase in applications. I don't necessarily think uh, most of them have the capacity to expand the number of slots they award. So what you'll find is medical school uh, and nursing school, uh, for example, becoming much more competitive to get into because I think there are restrictions on, you know, the number of professors that might be available to teach classes, uh, you know, the number of settings where you can place young doctors to train. So I think what's probably going to happen is not necessarily more people being let into medical school or a dramatically increased number, but actually a better and better and stronger and stronger pool of applicants each year. Conversely, do you, with so many doctors experiencing burnout or career regret right now, could some of them become the next wave of professors? Yeah, I do think, I think you're already seeing this and hearing about it anecdotally. You're, you're, well, again, you know, we probably see it in lots of different professions after the pandemic, you know, more people wanting to leave the practice of whatever they do maybe earlier than they thought. Uh, because they're worn out, they're fatigued, or move more to part-time work, or just diversify their talents in different ways. And so in medicine uh, and in in nursing, you may see more practicing doctors, practicing nurses who say, you know, I'd love to get more involved in teaching, not just because it it helps them in terms of lessen the amount of fatigue-inducing direct patient care work they might have to do, but also because they may see a need to lend their talents to, you know, helping the younger set be more prepared for the world they're coming into in healthcare post-COVID. Well, you're on the front lines there. You're actually teaching classes. Will you be standing in front of students this fall? Yes, yes. So the plan is right now, uh, I think most universities are, are, if not the vast majority of them, are planning to, uh, you know, go back to quote-unquote normal, fingers crossed, as long as the illness doesn't take a, a negative trajectory. I think students, professors, everyone alike is sort of looking forward to that day coming. The name of Dr. Tim Hoff's article is Pandemic-Inspired Idealism is Prompting Careers in Healthcare, caveat mTOR. It was published on May 11th at statnews.com. A good way to stay healthy is to stay employed. That's the topic of today's Academic Minute. Your employment has a lot to do with your health in the U.S. I'm Dr. Lynn Pascarella, President of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And today on the Academic Minute, Michelle Thornton, Assistant Professor in Health Services Administration, examines the correlation. In the United States, employment and health are closely linked through the reliance on private health insurance benefits. My research focuses specifically on ethical and safe decision-making around this topic. Understanding the relationship between health and employment has risen in priority during the pandemic, as many employers were forced to lay off workers or cut benefits in response to the rapidly changing economic conditions. Generally speaking, I rely on core epidemiological principles, public health theory, and business ethics And from these three areas, I've developed an approach that gives employers a framework to make grounded, ethical, equitable, and safe decisions during pandemics. Epidemiology is the study and analysis of the distribution, patterns, and determinants of health and disease. Given how much time each of us spend at work, it's important to explore how this plays out in the workplace. Over the past 12 months, employers had to decide when and if they could remain open, how to innovate around remote work, and what adjustments could be made to keep employees safe. Moving forward, this extends to whether or not to require things like COVID-19 testing and even vaccinations. 
Each one of these decision points requires employers to consider the implications to the employees, both individually and collectively, their privacy and autonomy, as well as the community they interact with. And finally, the overall long-term sustainability for the business. While we may be on the upside of battling COVID-19, all research points to the fact that this will not be the last infectious disease outbreak we face. The toolkit we've created provides employers with an actionable set of ethical decision-making criteria to examine these dilemmas to make the best overall choices for all involved stakeholders, while simultaneously balancing their accountability for helping to control or mitigate the spread of disease. That was Michelle Thornton of SUNY Oswego. You can find this, other segments, and more information about the professors at academicminute.org. The Academic Minute is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in partnership with the Association of American Colleges and Universities. That's all the time we have for this week's program. If you'd like to listen again, join us online at our flagship station's website. Go to wamc.org and click on the programs link. While you're there, subscribe to our podcast or any of the other WAMC or National Productions podcasts. And if you have any questions or comments about the program, send them in. Our email address is knowledge at wamc.org. And you can find us on Twitter at TBOO Knowledge. I'm Bob Barrett. Be sure to join us next time for another edition of The Best of Our Knowledge. Bob Barrett is producer of The Best of Our Knowledge. Dr. Alan Chartok is executive producer. The Best of Our Knowledge is a production of WAMC Radio's National Productions, which is solely responsible for its content. Hear more at wamc.org.